Um, hi, everyone. My name is Zuleika Krachiwala. I'm an undergrad student at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And today I will be talking about my research on understanding sociocultural accessibility barriers for refugees with disabilities in the US. Um, this research was done under the direction of Dr. Fawad Hamidi in the Designing Participatory Futures Labs. Next slide. So today I'm going to give a brief introduction and uh, methods and then be going into an in-depth uh, discussion on my findings, discussions, and conclusions. Next slide. Um, so for, first we'll be talking about the introduction. Next slide. So some background, uh, 79 million people are forcibly displaced worldwide, a figure that has almost doubled in the past 10 years. Uh, the definition of a refugee was first defined in 1951 at the United Nations Refugee Convention, but has evolved throughout the years and in 2016 has uh, included uh, the definition to be refugees or people who are from adverse, who are affected by adverse climate change, natural disaster, or other environmental factors as well. Next slide. So the refugee numbers uh, are continuously increasing. So we believe that proportionately, we need to also increase um, the cap capacity building efforts of host countries and relevant organizations. Next slide. So um, historically, refugee, the refugee population and the disability population have been seen as two separate communities. And you can see that by the um, United Nations Conventions on Refugee Rights, not including disability within um, their definition. And so um, we have seen historically that this is changing throughout the years. Uh, the UNHCR, you know, they now put in a specific guidance on how to systematically account for disability in refugees. And so um, this kind, these this kinds of efforts have shown great results, including, for example, um, they decide, they began asking, uh, including specific questions about disability during registration time in Jordan. And this has shown, uh, get, resulted in about 45% of Syrian refugee households have at least one individual with disability. And so this kind of uh, beginning uh, results uh, shows us that there is a warrant for new work in the accessibility research community towards understanding and addressing the needs and desires of this growing and diverse population. Next slide. So um, we have identified this research gap that um, existing research has studied disability and forced migration uh, separately. And we believe an intersectional approach is needed to study how disability and forced migration um, interact and impact each other. Uh, next slide. So now I'll be going through the methods for our, our research project. So we conducted six semi-structured interviews with uh, either uh, government and non-governmental uh, community workers who have directly worked with refugees in the greater Baltimore area. And we asked questions within three domains of healthcare accessibility, technology, and COVID-19. And I will be presenting our findings on the first two topics. Our participants included six participants between the ages of 20 to um, 60 years old. We interviewed two females and four males. And we've had experience, we had people with experiences of four years to up to 10 plus years. Next slide. Okay, so now I'll be going over our findings. So um, our findings I will be going over uh, quite briefly since we have a few. And uh, we would like, if, if you would like to have more details, please refer to our paper. So our first domain was um, learning about barriers to accessing health and disability resources. And our participants identified two barriers, uh, cultural and language barriers. Next slide. So the cultural barriers affecting accessing healthcare within the refugee population included acknowledgement, communication, and treatment of mental health challenges, especially um, the impact of stigma of uh, mental health stigmas that impacted the acknowledgement communication treatment of mental health in both the refugee population and in um, healthcare providers. So uh, this stigma would prevent uh, refugees from going to access healthcare. And then it would also prevent um, sometimes a, a good communication between the healthcare provider if they had stigmas uh, connected towards mental health and uh, refugee populations. We also saw a severity of stigma, sometimes depending on the nature of the disability uh, participant actually, interestingly enough, suggested that um, if a refugee had mental health concerns, they were often seen as possessed or cursed, 
but if they had a physical disability in our participants' words, it was seen as a badge of honor. They also had um, focused on survival rather than mental health. And um, there was also a lot of survivor's guilt. And so that's where we got the um, quote from, hey, I'm here, I'm okay because I'm alive. So being alive was enough that a lot of, uh, especially adult refugees didn't go uh, further to access um, healthcare, especially within the mental health domain. Next slide. So what are the impacts of these cultural barriers? Um, one big one was getting care in time. Uh, and then another one was uh, keeping steady employment and providing for families. So our participants proposed solutions in many different areas. They, they felt there was a need for further effort to learn diverse cultures and languages and have more anti-racist and anti-bias training, uh, both within healthcare provider training and regular um, like people with, that worked within organizations that supported refugees. And then working with community advocates and religious leaders. So this is usually the first, the, the first types of people that refugees reach out to. And so if there can be a connection between health healthcare providers and community advocates and religious figures, where um, you know perhaps they can give recommendations to healthcare services that use interpretation um, services or you or have more cultural training, then this would be a really effective um, solution. Next slide. So now let's talk about language barriers. Um, the language barrier caused uh, interpretation challenges, and this was one of the biggest things talked about by participants of all challenges, including uh, cultural factors. There was also translating re uh, better needs for translating resources assessments. So there's a better need to understanding what languages are needed in each specific st state or city. And then on all levels, including healthcare, po uh, police, public health, public transportation insurance, there's a need to work together to know what kind of languages um, need to be interpreted. For example, partic participants talked about perhaps someone is, has made the effort to get an appointment, but if they don't know how to navigate the public transportation, it then becomes a, great, a big barrier for them accessing healthcare. Um, language barriers is most prominent between healthcare providers. Um, oftentimes, even if there's technology, but not in the person's native language, the health outcomes weren't as good. Uh, limited language support and limit, limited uptake of services by stakeholders. So um, participants mentioned that even by law, if language accessibility is mandated, um, there is a gap in enforcement within healthcare providers. And finally, information being overwhelming. And you could take a second to look at some of the quotes we included. And next slide. So what are the impacts of these language barriers? Um, there are generational impacts, especially if adult uh, parent refugees are not, um, are not uh, you know, be able to speak English and this can you know, trickle down generationally. And then uh, prolonging services, interpretation uh, services that perhaps are not in the correct dialect, prolong getting uh, treatment, and then misinformation. The proposed solutions were to have better access to interpreters, multilingual healthcare providers, and technologies. So this is important, especially um, as we talked about working with community leaders. If they're aware of healthcare providers that have multilingual providers or interpreters, these are perhaps places to be uh, to recommend refugees. Um, healthcare providers incorporating language services into their practice. Um, participants really want to see more of that. Language training, including cultural and communication training, and then also mandatory language training by the government for incoming refugees was recommended by a few of our participants. Uh, next slide. So now I'm going to talk about the um, roles of digital technology, and we spread this out between current technologies and opportunities for improvement. So um, current technologies used by refugees were mostly seen in a positive way. Uh, they were seen as very supportive and perhaps just a need for um, you know, enhancing them. So cell phones and applications were the two biggest. Cell phones allowed for accessing healthcare, such as documents, making appointments, and social inclusion. And applications such as WhatsApp were very defined as um, applications that helped in social inclusion, support groups, and mental health. Google Translate was seen as uh, one of the best mediators for the language barrier, except, um, ex um, but a lot of participants wanted to see it being enhanced. And then Zoom was seen as a great platform for telehealth. 
And then the participants also described the VA's PTSD app as a great resource if there was, um, if it was in different languages. They felt that like uh, this form of like technology would help gap, uh, it will help gap the challenges of mental health stigmas. Next slide, please. So opportunities to improve technology used by refugees mentioned by participants was really having more adaptive technologies. So um, they wanted to see more improved language integration, developing specific resources for refugees, or perhaps making existing ones more accessible, such as the PTSD app, and then improved design for existing technologies. They wanted more visual and videos, uh, so, and perhaps this could mediate the language barrier that um, refugees were facing. Uh, next slide, please. So new technology ideas were in two main domains, uh, creating therapeutic and e-health applications that were specifically tailored to the needs of refugees, and then centralized locations for accessing information through a tech platform. This would include like digital platforms to spread destigmatizing de information on mental health and cognitive disabilities, as well as databases for service providers where they could um, would list all the services and resources available and whether they can be covered by insurance. So I could take a minute to look at some of the quotes we included. And then next slide, please. So now we'll be going through our discussion and conclusion. Next slide. So our discussion was um, we've seen a disconnect between refugee services and health and disability services from our study. There's a need for an intersectional approach to inform service and technology design for people with multiple aspects of a vulnerability identity. Uh, there's a need for reciprocal trust building activities and resources, and we believe there's an opportunity to leverage refugees' existing um, access to digital technologies, such as you know, uh, WhatsApp, smartphones, YouTube, Zoom, to co-design like relevant resources and media for them. And next slide. Um, so our future directions, according to our participants, as we said, the two main barriers were language and cult cultural differences. And so um, a next step we would like to take is to conduct a series of participatory design workshops with refugee families that focus on assistive technology, uh, the development of assistive technology and accessibility with their direct input. Next slide. So thank you for coming to our presentation and uh, any questions? Thank you so much. This was a really powerful uh, paper and I really appreciate it. Uh, the content within it. Uh, if anybody has a question, please raise your hand or put it in chat or feel free to unmute yourself. Um, one question I had is that uh, stigma was still something that was so prevalent within uh, the people you interviewed, the stigma of having a disability. And I'm curious if uh, you also mentioned that there was a much larger proportion of people that have disabilities within the refugee community because of the whole process of becoming a refugee. Um, did you find that the stigma was less within the communities than when they were, uh, before they became a refugee? Was there any progress in that? Uh, so a lot of times what we actually saw was uh, <laughs> the stigma was pretty prevalent even before coming uh, to the US. So before they even transitioned into becoming refugees, but a lot of participants talked about while here, uh, specifically in the greater Baltimore area, the lessening of the stigma as they uh, received more support. So uh, there was often a stigma related to mental health before coming, but that the, a lot of the resources here helped in destigmatizing it. Uh, there is a question. Did you find the specific refugee groups responded differently or was the response fairly consistent? Um, response to, did you find specific? Uh, response regarding what exactly? Uh, I'm happy to take this one if that's okay with you, Zalika. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so just to, uh, uh, so we were kind of interested because this was an, a scoping kind of exploratory study uh, to understand population level. So we did, we don't actually have the data for uh, enabling us to compare uh, different populations or different kind of subgroups within the community, uh, refugee communities. But we, uh, according to our 
um, uh, the, the experts that we worked with. And we specifically chose experts who worked with multiple groups of, the, uh, of uh, refugees, uh, just to kind of get that uh, uh, high level uh, perspective. Uh, uh, our findings were uh, present in all the communities. Hopefully in the future, and we really try to kind of work directly with refugees, but of course this study was also done during COVID and Zoleka did a lot of work in uh, uh, recruitment, but we had difficulty uh, working directly with refugees. So in the future, I think working with that uh, and looking into that question would be very interesting to kind of understand better how specific uh, subpopulations um, kind of uh, deal or face uh, some of these barriers. Did anybody else have a question? Are there technologies beyond Google Translate that offer real-time translation, similar to real-time audio translation offered by tools like Skype? Um, yeah, I can take this one. So. Uh, there were some technologies that uh, uh, some of the participants talked about. Um, most of them said that Google Translate was the main one that they used, but uh, it was interesting that a lot of them used uh, like uh, interpreting uh, like services within like Zoom or even WhatsApp. So besides like Google Translate, that was another um, real-time translation one that they used. And then also some refugees would use um, like online translators uh, just by like typing them in or um, another one was, uh, oh, they would use YouTube as well in order to like communicate uh, sentences. Yeah, and I would say if I may add to that, uh, one of the challenges and one of the opportunities we found is that with these translation services, uh, some of them do a better job than others, but because language is such an important factor, especially in kind of amplifying stigma or uh, kind of concerns within the communities, I think having uh, specific uh, types of, let's say, YouTube content or translation services that are um, kind of designed with uh, including the perspectives of and the lived experiences of uh, refugees with disabilities would really help mitigate some of the issues. Um, so hopefully that could be a um, direction in the future. I also want to thank the link in the chat about the um, uh, reference to language factors. Thank you, Sylvia. We'll look that up. Last year's Web for All had a, uh, <clears throat> a keynote speaker of Translators Without Borders, uh, which uh, was directly appropriate for this presentation. And Sarah mentioned uh, Skype. There's also Microsoft Translator, which is an app that pulls all the technology of Skype and allows multiple people of multiple languages to communicate with each other. I do have one question. We have just a little bit of time. All of these papers are based out of the University of Maryland or in Baltimore. So is there a community of researchers in the University of Maryland that is exploring broader subjects. Is there a commonality? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, others in the uh, group can also comment on this, but I personally am very happy to say that we ha do have a community in Maryland, both, uh, so there's several University of Maryland uh, campuses uh, across Maryland, so you know, some of my colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Kuber, Dr. Ravi Kuber uh, is here with several papers, and then also Dr. Kakori, Hernisa Kakori, um, we, we know each other, we have collaborated uh, before, and we can, hopefully we can also continue collaborating collaborating even more. Uh, but yeah, if others want to join uh, in this discussion, but I would say that yes, we do have a, a community, a small and growing community in Maryland in accessibility researchers. Yeah, I'm happy to add to that. I think there is a strong human computer interaction community uh, at University of Maryland. It's one of the, who has, you know, one of the second uh, uh, human computer interaction labs in the world. And so, Accessibility within that is like also very strong. There are at least uh, five faculty, at, at least, I may be miscounting, uh, they are doing uh, accessibility research at the intersection with human computer interaction. Um, and then more broader um, that, that, you know, there are, you know, stronger collaborations. The Trace Center um, is here as well. 
at University of Maryland College Park. And then there is a close tie with UMBC. You know, we give talks at each other often um, and, and we're very familiar with each other. Yeah, and I would uh, quickly add to that, uh, Ted, if you don't mind. First of all, thanks for the language uh, resources too, but also you mentioned that this session kind of brings together people who are kind of uh, pushing the boundaries. I think on behalf of all, all of us, I want to also thank web for all for being open to kind of these new topics or topics that are kind of looking at uh, areas of future uh, exploration. So, and and again, as I said, honored to be in this session. I don't know if it, I, I think the design kind of brought a lot of papers from our the universities in the in the um, state. So thanks for that. We have time for one more question. If anybody has a question for them, well, I'm not seeing any other questions. But I, I really do want to thank you for this presentation because. Um, Sylvia it works with translations and languages. And last year when we brought in Translators Without Borders, one of our goal was to also expand web for all to include not just accessibility of like uh, technical, but accessibility of language and information. And it's really nice to see a paper come the following year that builds upon that, that idea. Yeah, I agree, thank you. So our next paper um, is about <clears throat> investigating older adults adoption and usage of online conferencing tools during COVID-19. Um, I do want to, I'm sure they're going to discuss this, but for myself, I can tell you there was a little bit of confusion. It's not because the paper, it's just the terminology, but you have younger adults younger, older adults, and older, older adults. So I'm sure they're going to explain that, but you might want to keep your keep that in mind as they're going through, uh, through the paper. There are three communities uh, with very similar names. Um, and uh, who will be talking for today? Um, so my name is Hira Cray. Okay. Um, and so is the screen sharing? All yes, right? it looks great. All right, great. So hello everyone, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my co-authors, Dr. Ravi Cooper, um, Dr. Adam Avil and I will be presenting our research on investigating older adults adoption and usage of online conferencing tools during the COVID-19 pandemic. So our research was motivated by the increased usage of online conferencing tools like Zoom, WebEx and Skype um, due to the pandemic. So most people needed to continue regular communication um, and educational and work-related activities while practicing social distancing. Um, this was also true for older adults who needed to use these tools to continue talking with close friends and family members during this time, as well as attend regular medical appointments. Um, but however, older adults have been known to shy away from technology and past research has also showed that they could consider avoiding technology altogether to protect their private information. So as a result, our research questions aim to understand what are older adults' concerns and experiences transitioning to online communication? How do older adults resolve usability and privacy concerns while using online conferencing tools? How did older adults learn to use these tools and how did their experiences change over time? So in this presentation, I will be going over the study design and recruitment method, um, a subset of some of the key findings of our research, a discussion of a few interesting themes, um, some design decisions which can be informed from these findings, and then a summary of the main takeaways of this research. So we used semi-structured interviews and we recruited through an assisted living community, a mm -hmm. state operated senior center and snowballed through participants' personal networks. Um, these venues were selected to recruit 
participants from diverse socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds. The interviews themselves were conducted roughly one year after social distancing requirements were first mandated in the United States. They were conducted remotely, either over the telephone or using the online conferencing tool that the participant chose. And interviews lasted around 45 minutes and they were compensated for their time. The question topics of the interviews included the motivation criteria for choosing the specific tool or tools that they were using, the usability of certain features of these tools, like the waiting room or background filters, as well as privacy protection measures that they used, the resources that they used to troubleshoot issues when they came up, and the future use of these tools. So we recruited a total of 25 participants. Um, it was a fairly even split between male and female participants. Um, 12 of them were forced to adopt tools because of the pandemic, and 13 of them were prior users of the tools before the pandemic started. Uh, we considered older adults to be above the age of 60. Um, the youngest one we had was 60 years old, and the oldest was 89. Uh, now, as, as mentioned before, we split our participant in, into two subgroups. Um, this was because there was evidence of a digital divide in prior research within the older age community itself. So we had 15 younger older adults, which we um, defined as age between 60 to 74, and 10 older older adults, which were above the age of 75. Uh, we were interested to see if there were any differences in usability and privacy concerns between these subgroups. So our findings looked into older adults' transition to online communication, which covered their familiarization with the tool and adoption motivators. Uh, we then moved into their settings, preferences, perceptions, and reactions while using the tool and their reflections on their experiences of using them and how they would use these tools moving forward. So most participants talked about the advantages of remote meetings. They described being able to attend specific events like birthdays, anniversaries, and funerals, which would otherwise have been difficult to attend physically. And they also talked about the convenience and efficiency that these tools can provide. So as one participant said, when a group of 10 people are there, all 10 need to clear their schedules, but now they can sit in the office and just attend. I can attend five sessions a week now, but earlier only two per week, and I can attend it from anywhere. Now, older, older adults um, talked about learning how to use tools through tight-knit communities. They felt comfortable asking people around them for help and preferred relying, preferred re relying on others um, instead of doing a trial and error process to troubleshoot their issues. So as one mentioned, if I was on the phone, then I would ask somebody how to fix it. But if it's a persistent problem, then I would ask the IT connections expert in the living community. Um, on the other hand, some younger, older adults talked about the importance of in-person training, especially or ones conducted by their employers to prepare staff for remote communication uh, when the pandemic started. So one of them said that it was very important to have such an interactive training session with someone who knew what they were talking about so that they could ask them questions like, how do I grab the screen? Um, in specific contexts like online medical appointments, some older adults were anxious and felt less comfortable if the doctor who was speaking with them was someone who they were not familiar with or was a new doctor. So one of them mentioned that if it's not a doctor I'm familiar with, I would verify whether they are at least a qualified doctor in that practice by asking questions like their number and their name, and I will double check. Now, most older, older adults were concerned about bystanders when they were sharing their video feed in these calls. 
they explained instances where their spouse would walk behind them in clothing that could embarrass them or say something in the background that was meant to be private. Uh, on the other hand, they were not that concerned about inanimate objects in their surroundings and um, were sometimes quite happy to talk about them like books um, in their bookshelves. So they could compare tastes and discuss with other people in the call. Um, like one of them mentioned, most importantly, I don't care, you get what you see. I don't mind showing people what's in my background. Uh, most older adults also talk about closing background applications and browser tabs before either hopping on a call or sharing the screen. Um, some participants also mentioned that they were careful with what they said when they were on these um, conference calls. One of them mentioned that we still try not to talk about things like social security numbers over WebEx. We try to keep it off personal information and send it another way if we need to. I would also never say something like my password. Um, reflecting back on their experiences, most older adults said that the benefits of these conferencing tools outweigh the drawbacks of them. Um, some of them said that these tools helped them rekindle some of their old relationships, um, and they were very grateful for it. So one said it is cumulative in its relationship, especially for family, and I'm glad that we have. There were also um, some feature requests for these tools. Um, some participants would compare one tool to another, saying that Zoom would not allow participants to preview their webcam display before joining a call to check their appearance, and they preferred WebEx over Zoom for that feature. Um, one of them also said that if I wanted to send a photograph via Zoom, I don't know how to do that. That is certainly something that needs to be made easier. And it's going to be a major thing for older people because we have lots of medical problems. And this participant was talking about online medical appointments with um, doctors. Almost all participants wish to continue using online conferencing tools even after the pandemic ended. They said that these virtual meetings have become an integral part of their lives and it would be difficult to go back to how things once were. There were, however, a few participants who voiced concerns about having to learn how to use new technology once again if something similar happened in the future. So one of them said, will we continue to use this kind of technology? Yes, but the pressure of learning how to do it and helping one another learn how to do it we have gone about as far as we are going to go. Heaven forbid that we have another COVID. But there were some interesting themes that came to light from our findings. And one of them was contextual trust. We found that the value of trust seemed to differ in terms of context. Um, as we saw before in medical appointments, older adults were more anxious um, and less trusting if it was a doctor that they didn't know. But when it came to um, close friends and family members, there seemed to be a level of complete faith. Um, and they felt that they had nothing to worry about and spoke without any reservation. We also saw how personal biases can affect privacy decisions. We talked about older adults, um, older, older adults um, being all right with showing objects in their background and even um, talking about them and they also wanted to see what's in other people's backgrounds as well. They preferred having everything visible rather than having everything hidden. However, younger, older adults were hesitant to show their background because they were afraid of being judged by other people for their surroundings and also for their own appearance. Um, they, were, they were afraid that this would affect other people's perceptions of them, especially if they were meeting for the first time. We also saw that initial usability frustrations seem to overshadow privacy concerns, especially during the early stages of transition to online communication. Um, a few older adults also admitted to never even considering the um, possibility of privacy and security threats on this platform and hadn't heard of incidents like Zoom bombing occurring. Um, so this can give us some insight into 
the hierarchy of importance that comes for various aspects when older adults try to adopt online conferencing tools. Um, older adults also try to adopt the same tool as the person that they wish to talk to in some situations, um, especially if it was a close friend or family member, since they trusted the person who was already using it, they automatically also trusted the tool itself. Now, we saw that um, some younger older adults talked about in-person training and interactive sessions being very beneficial to them. We also suggest educational classes for older older adults to improve awareness of some of the features in the tool and overall familiarity with the tool itself. Um, specific privacy and security classes can then be an extension to describe measures that they can take to protect themselves. We also suggest uh, implementing nudges and visual guides on the interface for these tools to highlight privacy features um, as well as how this would help them. And in terms of adoption, older adults were more willing to trust and adopt new tools used by those that they were already familiar with. So younger family members like children and grandchildren can advocate and teach older family members about the benefits and um, adoption and setup process of these conferencing tools. Um, this would also motivate them to stay in touch with regular family calls during the pandemic. So the main takeaways of this research is that older adults form a community of practice to troubleshoot usability issues. They value trust higher in specific contexts compared to others, such as virtual financial and medical appointments. Um, effective communication and social interaction were prioritized over other higher level privacy concerns. And the design implications provided can inform designers of these tools who may overlook the needs of this important population. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation. Uh, it was a it was a what I really appreciated was the concept of, of privacy and trust and the flexibility that people had between them, uh, especially where some of the people were talking about how they didn't trust a new doctor until they until they could see their background and they could, you know, get their information. Uh, we do have a question for you. How many uh, how many of the people, the 25 that you uh, participated in this research uh, had a disability? Right. So there were not many participants who had disabilities. Um, we, we, uh, but it was like more of a self-reporting sort of situation. So there may have been instances where they were not comfortable with reporting the disability that they would have had. Um, in terms of medical appointments that they talked about, uh, most of them were sort of skin condition related, the ones which I talked about, uh, where they had to actually show themselves on camera. So those were some interesting findings that I could talk to them about. And surprisingly, they were quite comfortable with showing themselves on camera in those situations. <laughs> but again, this was with people they were familiar with. So if it was a regular doctor, um, that's why the feature request came up of being able to sh show images instead of actually showing themselves on camera. Uh, also, you, you mentioned Zoom, but also was Teladoc one of the tools that you researched? Um, so we asked participants what tools that they used. Zoom was the primary one. Um, we also had uh, WebEx and Skype and FaceTime show up. In terms of medical appointments, um, Kaiser Permanente was also one uh, tool that participants used. Um, Teladoc did not come up as one of the tools. And then there was a follow-up question. <clears throat> if you were to redesign a popular video conferencing tool like Zoom, so let's say we're going to take Zoom and add features to make it better for remote medical visits, what features would you add to Zoom uh, from talking to these participants that would make it more applicable for medical situations? All right, I think that's a good question. And I think that's a very uh, good um that's a very good area to look at future work on. So um, while older adults, of course, had some concerns about feeling less anxious and less comfortable, they weren't themselves able to provide too many um, ways to overcome that. Some of them mentioned that um, 
I wish I could, I could share a photo of myself instead of just showing myself, uh, prefer that. Uh, but they, they, on the other hand, wanted to see the video feed of the doctor, even if they didn't want to show their own feed, because they wanted to make sure that the doctor themselves were in a private space, so no one in the background could overhear them. Um, so it was, so those aspects of privacy did come into it. Um, and I think that also plays into some of the feature requests that they had. And Volker has his hand raised. Yes, sorry, I <clears throat> rather to ask directly. My RSI is pretty bad today. Um, so, so you mentioned that people were using more than one tool. Obviously, do, do you know um, roughly how many they were using and how difficult they found, found it moving between tools if they used more than one? Yes, that's a pretty good question. Um, there were a few participants who used two tools. Um, so some of them used Zoom and WebEx. And uh, there was this conception among them that Zoom needs to be used for more informal calls and WebEx needs to be used for more like formal calls and because if for some reason they felt that it's more secure, um, but they couldn't really express why. They felt that, well, a lot of, a lot of uh, companies use WebEx, so it has to be more secure, right? So that was their um, perception of the privacy and security of these tools. Um, so whenever they had to talk about something which was more work-related, they would switch from Zoom to WebEx, they would close other applications, other background emails. Um, and another instance was people who use Zoom and FaceTime. Um, they specifically use FaceTime for talking with family, um, and they would use Zoom for other um, purposes like their book clubs or um, coffee hours or gatherings with other societies. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I also got the impression that there was a generational difference, whereas the younger, older adults tended to use um, applications that were you know, provided by their work or were the ones that they were told to use, whereas the older, older generation were the ones that used applications that had the less complexity that they could easily connect with their neighbor or their friends, and they would actually adapt and use the application their friends could use rather than trying to teach them a new. Is, is that accurate? Yes, yes, that's quite accurate. There were very few older adults who actually try to research themselves on tools that they wanted to use. Most of them were either observing what other people used or just directly using what someone told them to use. And they were, they were okay with that. They didn't really object to it that much saying that, oh, I found a different tool that I want to use instead, or I've already learned a different tool. So I'm just gonna stick with that. Um, they were quite all right with just being told which tool to use or just using whatever other people were using. And which is the most like the least hassle requirement. Are there any other questions? I think we're at time to wrap this up. I want to thank everybody and especially at the University of Maryland because <laughs> you have pulled together some amazing research for this uh, section. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for the questions and for being here today. And I'll pass it on to uh, Dragon and Victoria. Hello, uh, we are going to uh, oh, have our uh, <laughs> closing uh, session. So I think uh, I can uh, start uh, our uh, slides. Tamil, uh, you can start and then I Thank can you. continue later. Thank you very much. I'm hoping everybody can hear me okay. Um, great to be with you today. Uh, on behalf of Shukru and myself, Donald Fitzpatrick, we are the program chairs for this particular event. And what a wonderful event it has been. Thank you to, to everybody for that. Next slide, please, Shukru. So. Yes. What did we do for the last two days? Well, we, we packed in a lot of things. We, there was a lot of things happened in, in, in two days of virtual conference. We had three awesome keynotes. 
um, which were, I, I certainly found all of them extremely interesting and inspiring, very, very different uh, and equally uh, inspiring and interesting. We had four paper sessions with 11 technical papers and seven communications papers. And I can speak for Shukru and myself when I say that we were extremely uh, impressed at the really, really high quality of submissions that we received this year. And um, given the hybrid and virtual uh, nature of this particular event, we really do want to thank everybody in the various time zones for your cooperation. We know and understand that some of you had to get up very early or stay up very, very late to make your presentations. And we really do appreciate your participation uh, in all of this. It's, it's, been, it's been great to have your, your work. We had uh, material on education, on web accessibility, on the multimodal web, and just completed uh, hybrid interactions, all fascinating stuff and just a demonstration of the wonderful work that's going on uh, across the, the various disciplines that uh, Web for All, the Web for All conference uh, encompasses. We had four accessibility challenge award candidates, which was, which was great fun yesterday. It's, a, it's always a really, really interesting session. So well done to all of you. And then we had our doctoral consortium on Sunday, uh, our two students who presented for us earlier today. And again, it's, it's great to see that uh, the next generation, the up and coming generation of, of, of our field is in such good hands, if that's the standard. It was, it was really interesting stuff. Next slide, please. There are a lot of people uh, without whom this wouldn't have been possible. Um, so next slide, please. We had, as we mentioned earlier, we had some three keynotes. Our first one was Luz, Luz Rayo, uh, who discussed our, the story behind Detective and how we brought research and dyslexia into, into Spanish public schools, um, which, was, which, was, which was fascinating. That actually opened our, our conference yesterday morning. Next slide, please. Then we had Robin Christofferson yesterday afternoon. Uh, who, who gave us out with accessibility, in with inclusive design, uh, with some very interesting and, and in my view, very funny videos included in that particular talk. Again, as ever from Robin, a very, very thoughtful and uh, thought-provoking presentation. Next slide, please. Now we had our William Loughborough Memorial Address, um, Julia Abascal, from, uh, who discussed with... Um, Web accessibility and beyond in e-government, uh, a topic again very close to my own heart, I have to say, because with the impending arrival of the European Accessibility Act, it was a very, very relevant and again, extremely inspirational talk. So to all of our three keynote speakers, a very heartfelt and sincere thank you. you your insights really enriched and enhanced our conference. And we're, we're, we're really, really pleased and honored that you took the trouble to present here with us over the past two days. Our next slide, please. We want to thank our sponsors. Um, again, without them, a lot of what we've done over the last two days would not have been possible. We want to acknowledge Google's support and sponsorship of our doctoral consortium. We want to acknowledge IBM's scholarships for students with disabilities. Meta, who sponsored the sign language interpreting. And Intuit, who sponsored the best paper awards. Again, to all of you, a sincere thanks. Next slide, please. Again, this conference, as well as our sponsors, has a, a significant number of supporters. We had Able Docs, who worked with us to make sure that the, the, the PDF documents were, were, were all accessible. OpenConf uh, for the conference management system. UD Talk for live captioning. And Interpreter Now for sign language interpreting. This conference is in cooperation with the following organizations. The web conference is co-located with the web conference, the ACM, SIGWeb, 
SIG Access, SIG Kai, and we are really, really pleased to be cooperating with all of those particular organizations. And again, thank you to everybody for your support uh, over the last number of days, and indeed before, on the journey to actually reach this particular stage and to get the conference up and going. Next slide, please. Um, oh, we have something in the background there. Beyond an e-government. Oh, there we go. We're OK now. A significant amount of work went into the organization of this event. And I would particularly like to pay tribute to our general chairs, Dragan, Dragan Akhmatovic and Victoria Neva, who we have all, everybody else in the organizing committee has worked with since probably October and their leadership was just been wonderful. Uh, I have rarely been part of an event which was led so beautifully. And I think I can speak for everybody on the organizational committee when I say a warm thank you uh, to our two general chairs. They did a wonderful job on bringing absolutely everything together. Myself, Donald Fitzpatrick and Shukru Arislan, uh, were responsible for the program. And I would like to depart a little bit from the slides now, if I may, to offer my personal thanks in particular to Shukru. I think Cynthia Bennett in her presentation earlier today mentioned the frustrations we can feel uh, sometimes as blind people with some of the tools we have to use. And Shukru, thank you so much because your, your, your help to overcome some of those frustrations and barriers in the tools that we had to use uh, was was wonderful and I'm very very grateful to you it was a pleasure to work with you uh, over the last number of months so thank you sincerely for all your your additional help um, I, 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 I really I really appreciate it it was great working with you um, our accessibility challenge chairs was uh, Xiaomei Wu and you O. again a great job organizing the judging and bringing all of that that whole uh, event and that whole challenge session together it was again it was a, a, a super job our doctoral consortium chairs was sergio machetti and james collin from who it was again organized a wonderful panel to guide and to mentor and to offer input to our next generation of of researchers so thank you both very much the ibf awards chairs were yevgen boroden and Chico Zakawa, again, a fantastic job done. Uh, our online chairs, again, online played a huge part in such a, a virtual event, as you can probably imagine. And Christian Bernaregi and Sehar Babaya, oh, what a fantastic job, just checking the accessibility of the platform, making sure everything, everything worked well done. It was, it was a really, really good job. Our publicity chairs, Alexander Hamley from the University of Manchester, who actually has been tweeting out on our behalf over the last couple of days. Anybody who's been following the, the W4A2022 hashtag and the W4A Twitter account will have seen Alex's great work over the past few days. And Mike Paciello in the background, mentoring everybody as he has done for, for quite some time. So again, our hybrid conference chair, Makoto Eki, who again was instrumental in making sure that things like the UD talk worked and worked really, really well. So thank you, Makoto. Fantastic, fantastic job. And our special issue chair, which I'll get onto in a moment, uh, Maria Rauschenberger. Next slide, please. Well, we've just actually today, we had uh, members of our steering committee who kindly stepped up. We, they, they thought they had escaped uh, Sylvia Rodriguez Vasquez acted as our session chair this morning, and Ted Drake this afternoon. They both uh, did a wonderful job as general chairs last year, thought they had escaped, but we got them to act as session chairs this year, and we're really grateful. And again, to them and everybody on the steering committee who offered wonderful uh, insights and, and guidance you know, behind the scenes uh, on the run-up to all of this, we, we are very grateful. Others on the steering committee, were uh, Greg Gay, Yevgen Borodin, Marco Vigo, Yalis Gesalada, and Simon Harper. To all of you for your input, your expertise, and your thoughtfulness, we, we are sincerely grateful. We also had an advisory committee, a program committee, 
And to other session chairs and attendees, everybody has contributed to making this such a lovely event for the past two days. To you all for the discussions, the questions, and the wonderfully thoughtful interactions with our, our uh, presentations. We thank you sincerely. Next slide, please. And like all good conferences, it doesn't actually have to end here. The conversation can continue. You can continue discussing uh, on Slack, W4A, W4A22.slack.com. The URL is there. Uh, if anybody uh, can't access it and needs it, we can certainly make it available. But keep the conversation going, the comments on the paper, uh, on the papers, et cetera. All the papers are actually in Slack. Uh, you can access them. You can discuss with the authors in there and uh, discuss with other people. You know, you'll find you find people with commonalities of interests and and things like that. So do please keep the conversation going after the event uh, is finished. Um, you can tweet at W4A conference, which is the, what, the, the, the Twitter hashtag, Twitter uh, username for, the, for, our, for our Twitter account. And W hashtag W4A2022 is the hashtag for the event. So if you have anything that you'd like to contribute to on, the, on that, but again, we are an accessibility event. So please don't forget to use all tags on your, uh, your images. So it'll be greatly appreciated uh, if you would care to do that. But do let's keep the conversation going. So many good themes and good things have started over the past two days that it'll be great to keep them going. Next slide, please. So go now. Yes. Go, yes, this is Sylvia. Uh, sorry to interrupt you before going uh, further. Uh, I would like to share a message on behalf of the steering committee. And actually, we would like to thank you all, all the members of the organizing committee this year, and to say that you have made an amazing job putting this um, edition together. So we want to congratulate you and to, to thank you for this uh, great event. Sorry for interrupting, but I had to share this message with you. We're delighted you did Thank interrupt, you. Sylvia. Thank you so very much <laughs> on behalf of all of us. That's great. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, it was very much a team effort, as you know, and uh, it, it's, 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 from my perspective, it was great to be involved in it. But we do appreciate that message from the steering committee. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So we now have um, the ACM uh, Transactions on Accessible Computing. Uh, Authors of technical papers and communication papers have the opportunity to propose extended versions of your work. Um, for the, uh, pardon me, my screen reader just decided to just jump to a random part of the slide. I'm back on track now, I think, I hope. Um, <laughs> so the, um, it, it's tired too. Um, the, as I said, people with, uh, who have submitted work here have an opportunity to submit extended uh, versions to, to propose extended versions uh, to the special issue. Um, last year's uh, special issue received eight high quality submissions. Uh, reviews are still in process and, and uh, you can all stay tuned for the first issue. So we're all looking forward to that one. Um, for this year's issue instructions, we'll actually follow by email uh, in, in, in due course. So we will be in touch with you by email. So just keep eyes, ears and everything else peeled uh, for, for looking at uh, for, for your email. And now I'm going to hand over to Shukru, who's going to round this thing out. Over to you, Shukru. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Daniel. Uh, and uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, you all uh, for your uh, contributions uh, and also uh, participation uh, for the W uh, for a conference this year. So I will uh, continue with uh, the doctoral uh, consortium, uh, which was conducted on Sunday. And uh, today we have had a session with a uh, short presentations uh, in our um, doctoral uh, consortiums. Uh, there were three expert uh, panelists, Yeliz Yeshilaza from Middle East Technical uh, University, Henry Sa uh, Kachori from University of Maryland, and uh, Faustin Huan from University of reading, sorry for my pronunciation. And we have uh, two uh, funded uh, students. Uh, one of these students is William 
Spain uh, with uh, a paper uh, entitled Sounds and Real Cells, uh, co-designing music technology with blind and visually impaired musicians. And the next one is uh, Tamelo Makati uh, with a paper entitled Machine Learning for Accessible Web Navigation. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, now uh, talk about accessibility uh, challenge uh, candidates. So we have four candidates for uh, judges and delegates awards. And on this uh, slide, we have four uh, papers uh, for these uh, awards. So first one is from Adam uh, Kaburg, uh, creating an open source customizable accessibility checker for content author. The next one is from Mohamed Gulam, Lorgat, Huga, uh, Paredes, and Tani Rocha, an approach to teach accessibility with game, gamification. Uh, another one is from Ovidia, Andrei uh, Schipor, Laura Bian Spilius, Ovidia uh, Chiprain Andrean, Alexandra Leonutian, Alexandra Tutor Andrei, and uh, Radu Daniel Watavu, personalized wearable interactions with wear skill. And the last one is uh, from Rachana uh, Sridhar, Rick Nicola Town, uh, Jin Yu Zhang, Kim Jin, Spencer Gregson, Eli Morcia Felis, Niveritha uh, Samudrella, and uh, Sharing Sadalagi, AIB, Automatic Image Description Engine for Review Imaginary. So we have two awards here, as I said. And first of all, I would like to announce the Judge Awards and then the Delegates Awards. So the Judge Awards goes to personalized wearable interaction with a uh, wear skill. Uh, so the authors of uh, this paper uh, here. Uh, OK, so let's continue with the next one. Uh, Sorry, the next one uh, is the uh, Delegates Award and uh, we have the same paper for the Delegates Award as well. So this paper actually won both of them. So you can see that we have the uh, actually both of the awards for the uh, same uh, paper here. So I would like to say well done for their work. And then we can uh, look at the best papers now which are sponsored by uh, Intuit. So for the, uh, and we'd like to uh, thank uh, for uh, these uh, awards as well. So the best technical paper award is uh, $2,000 and best communication paper award is $1,000. And for uh, these uh, candidates, uh, of course, we consider the review scores and then uh, we uh, actually create the committee uh, to uh, review uh, these papers again and give their scores. And based on these scores, we uh, selected the best uh, communication paper and the best uh, technical paper. We uh, had two uh, candidates for best communication paper and two uh, candidates for best technical paper. So let's start with the communication uh, paper uh, candidates i mean the best communication paper, paper candidates the first one is from andy uh, coverdale uh, sarah uh, lightweight and sarah Fortson, teaching accessibility as a shared uh, endeavor building capacity across academic and workplace context and uh, the next one is from Alexander Hampley, Elise Shilada, uh, Mark Elvigo, and Simon Harper, uh, optimizing the website accessibility conformance evaluation methodology. And the best communication paper uh, award goes to optimizing the web accessibility conformance evaluation uh, methodology. Uh, I think uh, Alex is here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Alex, are you here? Do you want to say something? I see actually his name, but maybe he is not here for now. 
So congratulations. Uh, so we can uh, continue with the best uh, technical uh, paper award. So we have uh, two uh, candidates uh, again. So one of them is from uh, Fidas uh, Salnes, Melian Wader, uh, Aporva uh, Ben Digeri, Tristan King, uh, Anirudh uh, Nakraj, and Ravi Kumar. Uh, how and why we run, investigating the experiences of blind and visually impaired runners. And the next one is from William Payne, uh, Fabiha Ahmed, uh, Michel Gardel, uh, Luke uh, Dubois, and Ami Hars. Uh, Sound cells designing a browser based music technology for Braille and uh, print notation. So this one uh, goes to, I mean, the best te technical paper award goes to sound cells designing a browser-based music technology for braille and print uh, notation. Congratulations. Uh, if you want to uh, say something, you can, of course, uh, take your turn. Oh, I'm, I'm here. This is really exciting. I've been reading web for all papers for a long time, but this is my first time um, presenting at the conference and to have the doctoral consortium experience. And then this is just um, unreal. So thank you all. I appreciate it. Congre congratulations. Uh, and uh, next year, uh, we will be in Austin, Texas, US. And uh, hopefully it will be in person. So we will be able to meet and uh, discuss in person. So uh, we are looking uh, forward to see you all uh, there as well. So that's it uh, from me. So if you would like to uh, tell something, of course, uh, you can uh, uh, take your turn. Dragon, Daniel. I think this pretty much wrapped it all. I mean, I'm really <laughs> happy to be here. And I thank uh, to you, Donald, Victoria, uh, all the organizing committee, the steering committee, of course, all the participants and authors. It was a really great experience. and. I'm really glad to be here with you. Thank you. Uh, this so, is Ted, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, this might seem uh, out of context, but I, I wanna thank the people in Lyon because last year when everything was really confused and we didn't know what we were gonna do with the web conference and web for all, the, the organizers in Lyon stepped forward and said, we'll take care of it. No matter what happens, we'll take care of it. So I just want to give a big thanks to Leon. And I may add that they had done really a great job. It was quite tough to decide the conferencing platform and everything else, and they helped us in any way possible. So really great thanks to them. So that's it then, uh, we can close uh, the conference. Uh, thanks again uh, for your uh, contributions and uh, participation to the W4A conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>